Monetizing your expertise with online content does not have to be complicated. In fact, it comes down to a few simple elements. And one of them is building an audience because nobody can buy something from you if they don't know you exist. So audience building is one of the most fundamental skills you could develop that will serve you for a lifetime. So in this episode, we're actually pulling back the curtain on how to actually achieve that. My guest today is Mike Dillard. Mike is one of the most respected online marketers and has built several multi-million dollar audiences over the past 15 years by using a simple yet effective strategy. And if you're going to listen until the end of this episode, you know exactly what this strategy is and how you can apply it to build your audience online. Hi, my name is Majero and welcome to Build Your Thing, the podcast where we help content creators find their unique creative voice, build their tribe of loyal fans and monetize their work. With that being said, let's get started. All right, Mike. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Matt. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to finally have you here. I've been following you for years, I think. Now it should be around eight years or so. And one of the things that you are a truly master of is actually being able to build audiences from scratch. So I would really love you to talk about, first of all, give our, our listeners a little bit of a backstory of the different audience that you've built across different industries, and then perhaps we could dig deeper into the nitty gritty and the process. Sure. Yeah, happy to. Uh, I've been building online businesses for probably 20, 20 plus years now. Um, during that time, I've produced about $60 million in sales, and I've built an email list that's well over a million people over that period of time. Now, obviously, that's not active subscribers today. Today, it's probably about 130,000. Um, but over time, over various companies, uh, certainly over a million. And building an email list specifically has really been, uh, you know, the center of my business. And it's not that, that that's been the intention. But by default, whenever you're building a business online, you're automatically going to start building a list of either prospects or customers. And you're going to have their email addresses and email marketing. And my personal experience has been the most effective way to sell products and generate cash on demand that I've ever discovered. And so uh, for me now, uh, you know, realizing that that's the most valuable asset that I can build, um, that's what I, I focus on. Uh, a lot of people are really focused on building social media on audiences. They're build, they're focused on building an Instagram audience or a YouTube audience, TikTok, whatever it may be, and those are great. Those are really good platforms, and I, uh, you know, share content on those platforms. I create content for those platforms, but uh, I've never really made those my primary focus because I have just seen too many horror stories from colleagues of mine who've spent you know, years of their lives building up these channels only to have them taken away. And that's something that people really need to understand is that you don't own your Instagram account, you don't own your YouTube account, you don't own your TikTok account, and those channels can be removed at will. And I think a great example of this in my own personal life was in 2020, I was very outspoken against uh, what was going on in the world, the locks, the lockdowns and, and things like that. And I'm very much a pro-freedom uh, individual. And I would start to make posts on TikTok about my personal opinions about what was happening. And, uh, you know, I was not a fan of, of what governments were doing around the world. And my Instagram account was basically shadow banned for almost 12 months, meaning if you looked up my name in the search, I would not show up. Ironically, the scam accounts that copy me would show up. And then the audience that I did have, my reach dropped about 90 to 95%. And so I really just stopped posting for a year. And if my business had been dependent upon that channel, I would have been out of business. Uh, the nice part about an email list is that it's yours. You own it. It's your data. Um, you can move it from one email service provider to another if you ever want to or need to. And no one can really take that away from you. And so that was a, another really big lesson learned for me and another reason why I love building email lists. Yeah, I totally agree. So there are so many things that you can do when it comes to creating content, right? So there are just so many platforms, like people chase followers, they chase likes, they chase, you know, um, social media subscribers. But 
the thing is like what what you keep at the end and what you can really download and put it into, into a into a save it's like your your email list right your csv file <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 100%. And it's very, very, very powerful. Now, the second thing that people need to understand is that an email list in and of itself is, is worthless. It's worth absolutely nothing. And if you want to verify that, uh, you can go out and you can buy an email list of any kind of category of people. You know, there's data companies that sell email lists and databases. And even if you had permission to send those people an email, at the end of the day, um, it's not really going to be worth anything because there's no relationship there. The money is in the relationship. The email list is just the communication channel. Um, but the amount of money that can be made by having an email list is directly proportional to the level and, and quality of relationship you have with your readers. So if they don't know you, if they don't like you, if they don't trust you, you're not going to make any money. But if they do know you, like you and trust you and you really invest in building in that relationship over time, uh, like you mentioned, you've been with me for eight years now. I have people who've been on my email list for 20 years. I have people, uh, a gentleman recently who said, I've saved every email that I've ever sent over the last 15 years because uh, he, st he studies my emails. And so for that reason, you know, uh, I've done really, really well. And so my goal whenever I send out an email is to, prov to provide my audience with value. It's, uh, it's not to make money all the time. It's to provide value first be of service. And then if I have a product or a service that I think can, can help them achieve their goals, I'll, uh, you know, I might do a promotion for that, or I might share that. And, and that can turn into a substantial amount of revenue. I think the most money that I've ever made from my email list was in December of 2010, I launched my second company in the financial education space, uh, just to my email list. I want to say I had around 200 to 300,000 subscribers at that point in time. And I was able to generate in seven days, $3.2 million in revenue just from that email list. And so that's the power uh, that an email audience has. <laughs> um, but those people had been with me from my previous company, right? They knew my story. They knew the value that I was going to deliver. Uh, they trusted me. And $3.2 million worth of, of, of product was purchased in a week because of that. Um, if they didn't know who I was, then yeah, then, then nothing would have happened. And so that's a really, really important piece of the puzzle. Mike, how do you define value? I mean, very simply put, in this context, um, you know, people often ask me, how often should you send an email or how, you know, yeah, I mean, that's probably one of the most popular questions. Hey, how often should I email my list? And there's no right or wrong uh, answer to that. Uh, there's companies out there who write emails and email their list every single day. And if you're providing value to those people every single day, then great. The more often, the better. The definition of value for me is, is this person going to f be glad that they read it by the time they're, they're done reading the email? Was that a good use of their time or was that a waste of their time? And that's really all it comes down to. So for me, I sometimes go weeks or months without sending an email. And that's certainly not what I would recommend, but I just, you know, my viewpoint on it is I only send emails to my audience when I really have something that I think is going to be worth their time to read and consume. And so that's really how I would define value. Um, and, you know, is, is the context correct? So if I have an audience that's full of entrepreneurs, um, you know, is the information that I'm sending relevant to them and, and, and why they subscribe to my channel? Uh, an example of this would be you know, I, my audience is primarily entrepreneurs and investors. And I think one time I did a promotion for like a health product in the past. Maybe I think it was a supplement or something along those lines. And it, you know, really kind of fell flat. Um, there was really no results that came from that at all. And that is just understanding that, hey, that was the wrong, you know, wrong kind of content for the audience that I have and what they're used to reading from me and, and why they subscribe to my channel in the first place. Um, so keeping that in mind is really important as well. How do you feel that, well, this may be something um, my audience would would care about? How do you take kind of the temperature of your of your list and what is actually going going on in their mind? Uh, again, you know, understanding why they subscribed in the first place. Um, you know, all of the people on my list, you know, most of them have subscribed because they're interested in learning how to make money, whether that's from starting and building a business or whether that's through investing. Um, 
And then out of all of the entrepreneur people I know, well, what are, what are they interested in? Most of them are interested in, in freedom and they're interested in what's going on in the world. And, you know, um, but you can stay in a very narrow targeted box or you can start to spread out a little bit. Um, just, you know, that it just really comes down to you. Ultimately, what I try to do is just be myself and be real with my readers. And so in addition to any kind of business or finance content, I might send out, I send out pictures of what I'm doing in my life. Uh, you know, my family trips that we're on events that we're at. Um, and it really is just talking to your readers like you would be sending an email to your friends. That's kind of, uh, you know, a frame or a context that I keep in mind as well. Um, and that is really important in just building that relationship. I would say the vast majority of my readers who've been on my list for a few years feel like they know me um, and like we're friends and and all of that, despite the fact that we've never met in person, right? We've never spoken on the phone. We've never really done anything, but they feel like they know me because I've involved them in my life and in my story. And that's a, just another really important way um, and a part, part of the process when it comes to building tr uh, trust and rapport. I love that. So, you know, for me, building an audience or the building an audience part of running a business has always been the trickiest part. So I don't really know why it's the case, perhaps because I'm an introvert, but I know that you are an introvert too, because I remember that in one of your trainings, you mentioned that you are, I think, an INTP uh -huh. um, person, uh, type, of, type of person, right? When it comes to the Maya Briggs test, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. So I, I would really love to actually learn more about how do you think about audience building? Uh, yeah. I mean, in my experience, introverts make the best, <laughs> make the best online marketers because uh, we prefer to sell online, you know, in, in, in talk online and teach online rather than, you know, in person at an event or, you know, that kind of a thing. And so um, Eben Pagan, Frank Kern, myself, Ryan Dice, like all very successful internet marketers and all introverts. I think most of us are INTPs as well, with the exception of Ryan. I think he's an INTJ. Um, so the way I think about it is really simple. Um, I'm Ironically, I'm never really going out and intentionally trying to build an audience. That's never my goal. My goal, well, I'll put it this way, build every single one of the audiences that I've built, which is again, primary my email list has come as a result of paid advertising. It just comes as a byproduct of my paid ad campaigns. And so I'm never out saying, Hey, I want to build an email list. I'm out saying, Hey, I want to sell my products and my services. And in so doing the email list gets built by default, right? So there's two ways to build a list. There's the organic way, which is you know, promoting, uh, you know, building up your social media channels, your Instagram, your YouTube channels, and then saying, Hey, to those people click here to go download my report or watch my video or uh, register for my webinar or whatever it may be. And in so doing, they're automatically added to your email list. That's a really slow way to do that. Another way people used to do that in the past, you know, was making blog posts and things like that and, and getting SEO traffic and then putting an opt-in on their, their webpage or their blog. And those, those, those ways are fine, but they're really slow. And so for me, I want to, you know, make sales in a, in, in a fast way. And the fastest way to do that is through paid ads. And so for example, right now, you know, we're in the middle of setting up a campaign for, uh, you know, our victory mastermind community that you're a part of. And we just ran a little ad test, um, a week ago. I was like, I want to see how this is going to do from an ads perspective. And what we did was we, you know, wrote the ads, obviously we put up a capture page and that is where you can enter in your email address, uh, to get this, basically this report that I put out, uh, around, you know, five predictions of what I see happening in the next 10 years from an economic perspective. And so have that page, enter your email address, get the report. And then on the next page, there was a sales letter for the victory mastermind. And so we did a quick ad test over the course of about five days and the capture page converted extremely, extremely well. We generated a thousand opt-ins uh, for $2 a piece, which is really unheard of these days. That was somewhat normal 15 years ago. Today, an email subscriber or an opt-in, you, you'd expect to cost anywhere from four to $10 um, for each one. And so to generate 
a thousand opt-ins for two dollars a piece was phenomenal. Um, the sales letter didn't convert as expected, and so I've got to go back and I've got to redo that. Um, my expectation is that it's it was too long. It's about thirty pages long, so it was a lot of reading. Um, but we'll tweak that. But at the end of the day, Matt, that's that's how it was done. A thousand opt-ins in a week. Now, what will happen is we'll get the sales process uh, optimized so that uh, you know we'll basically sell enough product to cover the cost of our ads and ideally more and make a profit on the front end, which means now we can generate an endless number of new subscribers for free or at a profit. And when we ramp up a campaign, uh, we're usually generating between 200 to 1,000 opt-ins every single day. So over the course of a month, that's 30,000 new readers for our newsletter. Over the course of a year, you can do the math, 400 plus thousand readers that year. And then at that point, it's just about nurturing and building a relationship with those people and delivering value. And 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 that's how it's done. Yeah. I mean, on paper, it just seems so easy, right? But when you actually have to do the thing, um, there are so many things that you have to get right. So, you know, I know that Many people, when it comes to paid ads, you know, they try to blame the platform. They try to blame the targeting. But what I found out, like I burned, I don't know, perhaps 20 grand or so on, on, on ads too over, over the years. Certainly not that much as you. But um, the thing that I discover is that the hardest part is being able to just get the offer right. <laughs> so... When Mike Dillard has to come up with an offer, how does that look like? Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. So ultimately, it has nothing to do with the platforms. It has everything to do with how, how effective is your communication. And every single step in the process matters. So the very first touch point is your ad itself, right? Is your headline good? Is your image good? Is your video good? Um, then uh, that headline and that, excuse me, that ad needs to be congruent with your capture page. So when they click on your ad, does the capture page continue the conversation? The ad starts the conversation. The capture page continues the conversation. So they have to, they have to basically match and one has to hand off naturally to the other. And then if they enter in their email address and opt in, does the sales message or sales presentation then continue that conversation, right? So it all has to match and it all has to be on a, on a continuation of a story that began with your ad. And then does the offer at the end of that sales presentation fulfill on, you know, the promise that you made from the very beginning uh, in your in your ad, right? Does it enable them to get the result that they're after that your ad, you know, brought up to begin with? And so that's really what's required to have a funnel that converts cold traffic into a paying customer successfully, which allows you to build your your list automatically. And that just comes down to copywriting. And so for me, the most important skill in the world, if you're going to market online, is learning copywriting. Without that, nothing else works. Your ads don't work. Your capture pages don't work. Your sales presentation doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so if there's one place to put your time, it is in copywriting. And I spent, uh, when I first got involved with this industry, about a year, year and a half of studying copywriting every single day, buying every book I could on the subject, every course I could on the subject. And really focused my time and attention on that. Um, and that's why I've been as successful as I have been. If I hadn't done that, I would I would probably not have succeeded at all. And I'd be doing something else today. So that's your highest point of leverage. If you want to spend your time and figure this out, that's where you need to start and what you need to master. Every business I've ever started has been inspired by an, a personal problem that I had myself. And I either figured out the solution over years of trial and error. And then I was like, hey, I figured this out. If you have this problem as well, I can help you. Or it was basically a process of, hey, I'm going to figure this out. And you can follow along with me if you have this challenge as well. But ultimately, it just comes down to, yes, what are my biggest personal problems in my life that I want to solve? And I tend to you know, look out in the market and say, hey, are there are a lot of other people who have this problem as well. And in each of these cases, I couldn't figure out or I couldn't buy a solution that already existed, um, at least not in the way that I wanted it to. And so a great example of this was the second business, the one that did $3.2 million in a week was called the Elevation Group. And this uh, I launched in 2010 after the crash of 2008. And the crash of 2008 was a big wake up call. I watched 
everybody you know that was in the markets lose half their money you know in a, a very short period of time and i went and i was about 30 years old and i wanted to start learning about investing i was making money but i didn't know how to invest it that was my my problem and so i went to the lo- you know, local bookstore and all of the f- books on finance that i read were now irrelevant all of the advice that they were giving after the crash of 08 um, was not really relevant anymore. If I had followed that advice, I would have lost all of my money as well. And so I needed to figure out how to invest the money that I was making. And yet the market had changed. What used to work was no wrong, longer relevant. And I couldn't find a solution that answered my questions and that gave me a path and that, that provided the information I was looking for. So I was like, okay, well, fine. If I can't buy this to solve my problem, I guess I'm going to have to go figure out and I'll create the solution to my problem. And that's what inspired me to start that business. Um, it was the pursuit of those answers. And the question that I asked was really, hey, how do the rich invest? How do wealthy people invest? How do they make money when markets crash? And what do they do with their money? Because the average person just lost everything they had, but the rich got richer. What are they doing that the average person is not? And that's what I wanted to figure out. And so that's what I started the business around. And I started it by interviewing people who were wealthy, uh, you know, millionaires, billionaires. And I just started interviewing them and asking them, hey, what do you do with your money? How do you, how do you think about money? How do you invest your money? How do you make your money? Um, and it turned into that business. And the reason why it did so well, you know, and it's important to understand that I was not the expert in this scenario. I was just kind of the Oprah Winfrey interviewing the people who were experts. But the reason it did so well is because everybody else out there got burned, right? And they were looking for answers too. And so that's why that business did as well as it did. Um, I'm trying to think of, of another example right now, but that's probably the best one that I can think of is I always start with my personal challenges or problems. And then I, if I can't figure out a solution, um, I'll make one myself that fits the criteria that I'm looking for and has the quality that I'm looking for. And then I will gauge the market and I'll say, Hey, are there a bunch of other people with this same problem? And they're looking for a solution as well. And that that's pretty much it. It's not super complicated. Uh, one of the thing that you can do once you do have an email list or a social media audience is ask your audience and I'll do this maybe once a year, I'll send out a poll. And I'll say, hey, well, what do you need help with most right now? And I'll give them three options, A, B, or C. And that really helps me understand where my audience is at and what they're focused on and what they want help with. Um, and a lot of times I'll, I'll take that into consideration and I'll put my focus on creating a solution for the problem that they, they said they have and that they want help with most. So that's another uh, way to go about it as well. That's very interesting. So one of the things that you, you mentioned is that you are actually trying to get the temperature of the market to see if the problem that you have is actually a problem that other people have too, because we may get caught in our own biases, right? Thinking that, well, we have this problem. So um, there has to be other people online who have the same problem too. So is there any specific process that you're, that you're using? Obviously, I think with the example that you gave with the elevation group, I think that this is, this was kind of pretty obvious, but perhaps other offers that uh, you came up with. Um, are there any tips that you can share with us? One more thing about the Elevation Group that's important, right? There's dozens of financial education companies online that that teach people how to invest or that provide stock picks or strategies or opportunities or whatever it may be. Uh, Agora Research, Stanber- Stansberry, Palm Beach, um, Motley Fool, like, and these are all hundred plus million dollar companies. They're massive. They have massive audiences. They have, you know, a dozen different products and services to offer and huge teams. And it's like, why, why would I need to start my own version of that? Um, and so to answer your question, if you look out in the financial education space, obviously that's a massive market. There's companies doing a billion dollars a year in revenue, right? So, um, most people in life are interested in learning how to make money or invest money. So for me, the audience piece was, was easy, right? Anything with health or wealth, uh, you know, relationships, etc. that's something that every single human on the planet for the most part has to deal with. So those are really easy to figure out. Um, 
And so that, you know, I, I guess that's important to understand. Uh, the, the second piece of that is that I needed to stand out in the marketplace. And so when I started the Elevation Group, despite all these competitors, um, the reason why I didn't just become a customer of those services and use those was because they weren't answering the questions specifically that I had or in the way that I wanted. Um, for example, most of those just companies just provide stock picks. Hey, here's this opportunity, here's the stock pick, or here's this crypto pick, or whatever it may be. Their, it's, the, their product back then was uh, always in written form. It was in an email newsletter form. It usually had you know stock charts of some kind. And for me, I was like, this is complicated. And I'm not a, a stock picking expert, and I don't know how to buy options, and I don't know how to do all of this other stuff. And frankly, neither does anybody else that I know in the average world. And so this isn't really helpful for me. I was like, I want something that is, you know, using terms that I'll understand that the average person understands. I want to talk about strategies that my mom and dad would, excuse me, have an interest in. Um, and I wanted it to be presented in a really simple, you know, way, uh, I, specifically in videos, right? I just wanted to talk to people. And, and so I specifically built that business in a way that I went out and I bought all of these competitors' products. And I said, here's what I like about these and here's what I don't like about them. And I created mine to fix the, pro the, pro the parts that I didn't like. Um, and I think that that was a really important reason for the success that it had. And that's something that you always want to do whenever you go into a niche. The bigger your niche that you go into, the better. But the bigger your niche you go into, the more competitors there are. And that's fine. Competition is a really good thing. Um, you just have to figure out a way to stand out from the crowd. And so that's what I did in order to stand out from the crowd. Um, you know, as far as the offer goes, the next really part of my process is, okay, I've got the niche and the group of people I want to serve. I've got the idea as far as the problem and the solution that I want to provide. Uh, I understand how I'm going to stand out in the marketplace. And now it's a question of, is this worth my time to build an, a business around and invest the next three to five years of my life in? And, you know, is this obviously a subject matter that I'm going to want to work with every single day? Because if not, don't build a business in that niche. Uh, it's not going to go anywhere. But then it's, okay, what's the business model and what's the pricing? And for me, in that regard, I start with how much money do I want this business to be able to make, you know, at a minimum? So when I started EVG, I was like, I, you know, I want this business to make at least $100,000 a month. I want it to be recurring revenue, which means uh, it needed to be a monthly membership of some kind. And I only wanted to make one, you know, really good content piece a month. And I wanted to write one email a week to my list because I was having a kid uh, at that time. So I want a really easy business that's low drag. I don't want any employees. It needs to make a hundred grand a month or more. And I only want to do again, one major content piece a month. And so you can really define what you want your business to look like from a revenue standpoint and from a lifestyle standpoint. And I think it's very, very important to define what those are from the very beginning. Because now with those guidelines and criteria in mind, that's going to determine my offer, right? It's going to determine what the product costs, how it's structured, you know, what's delivered every month. Um, and that could have gone in multiple different ways. I could have said, I want to build this into the next Agora. Well, then that's a different ball game. Now at that point, I need a front end product. I need, you know, five plus back end products. I need a product that starts, you know, at 49 to $99, you know, as a front end. And then I need stuff that goes all the way up to, you know, three to $5,000 on the back end. I'm going to probably have to hire a couple of people to, to work on that with me. And that's a different business model. And those are different offers. And so it's important to define what you want your business to look like. That's going to help define the offer um, and what you have to deliver. How do you wrap your offer in an enticing way? I mean, for me, I try to, you know, just kind of get to the point. Um, I, 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 I try to just be really clear and not beat around the bush because I think especially in today's market, people don't have time to waste, right? It's just like, hey, man, get to the point. And we're, we're in the age of 15 second Instagram stories, right? And TikTok stuff where it's people's attention spans are super short. And so I think just getting to the story or excuse me, getting to the point as fast as you can is important, but you need to have 
proper context, right? And this this is comes down to the whole copywriting process, which would be a whole different show. Um, but you've got to figure out how your product or your service is unique. How is it different? How is it different than everything else out there in the market? How is it better? How is it newer? Whatever it may be. Um, you know, ultimately that's something every product and every business has to do is they have to, uh, demonstrate the unique features of, of what it is that you're selling. And so, um, that's going to be, that's a hard question to answer because it's going to be different for everybody, but it, but it certainly needs to be a part of your story that you're telling. Um, you know, and I'll use an example and let's take a commodity, right? So where there's very little difference between thousands and thousands of, of similar products. And the example that we'll use is wine, a bottle of wine, right? And so you can go into a wine store and there's hundreds of different bottles of wine available that you can buy that are basically all the same thing. You know, one's got a little bit different price and it's got a little bit different taste, but at the end of the day, it's all bottles of wine. The only real way that a product can stand out in that category is by its label, right? How does the bottle look and what does the label look like? Most people, when they're shopping for wine, if they don't have a favorite, that's what they're going by. They're going by price and they're going by label. Some people want really cheap wine because they don't want to spend a lot of money. Other people want like, hey man, I want a, a really good bottle of wine. I'll spend a significant amount of money. Um, and so you have to decide who do you want to appeal to? Who's your customer, right? Do we want to sell the best wine that we can make at any, at any price? Or are we going for the masses and we're going for volume and um, you know, we're not going for huge profit margins, but we're, we're going for, for bulk orders to specs and Costco and, you know, things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're going to try and sell wine and stand out in the marketplace, it's all about, you know, well, I guess the question is, how do you do that? Um, it, for me, it's all about telling the story of how your wine was produced, if I had to sell a bottle of wine, I'm going to go out to the vineyard. I'm going to get to know the stories behind the founders and the owners of the vineyard. I'm going to get to know the story behind the, you know, the sommelier or the person who's in charge of, of making the wine. And I'm going to ask them everything I can about their life, their story, their history, the history of the land, the history of the vineyard. And I'm going to write and create marketing pieces that tell that story. Why? Because when people hear the story, they get emotionally invested in the story. Now those people who own the vineyard in some way um, are a part of their life, right? Um, that vineyard is something that they know all about. They know the design, they know the, the unique features of the soil, they know the history of that land. Um, uh, you know, the Psalm, they know that person's life story and, and his or her philosophy when it comes to the winemaking process and what they prioritize and, and what makes, you know, their take on wine unique or different or special. And so that's by telling that story in your marketing and in your emails and on your website, your social media, that's how you can take something as simple as a bottle of wine and make it stand out and, now, if I understand all of that information and I walk into the store and I've got that bottle of wine and a hundred others, which one am I going to buy? I'm going to buy the one that I know and that I feel an affection for, right? That I feel a rapport with and that I have an understanding of because it feels comfortable to me and it feels valuable to me because I understand its history. Now, when I give that bottle of wine to somebody else, maybe I'm buying it for a party. Well, guess what? Now I can tell my friend that I'm giving the bottle of wine to the history about the vineyard. And now the wine becomes special to that person as well. Right. And so that's how you can take something that's super ordinary and make it special. What you mentioned earlier, when it comes to um, your latest uh, ad test, you came up with, with a funnel, right? following all the tips that you that you, that you gave us mm -hmm. but now comes comes the moment of, of truth right so you are just launching the ad and now you're adopting this mindset of kind of a rocket scientist right so you just have to see okay what are the things that aren't working um as expected and how to fix them so i don't know about you but i have a pretty hard time when it comes to really sitting down and trying to analyze and trying to find out um where um, where the problem is. So 
first question, is this something that you can relate to? And if yes, then how do you overcome that? And if no, um, what is like your kind of process of breaking things down and trying to, to really find where the, the problem actually is? Thankfully, that's usually pretty easy because it's all just math, right? So, you know, if you use a platform like ClickFunnels to, to build your funnel, um, you can see the conversion rate of every step in the process. So I can see the cost per click I'm getting from my ad account. I can see the conversion rate of my capture page and I can see the conversion rate of my sales page. And so in our example, right, my ads click through rate was amazing. My capture page conversion rate was 43%, which was phenomenal. Uh, and then sales conversion was less than a percent, which was horrible. You want to, you know, I ideally see a conversion rate of around three to 5%. Um, and so for me, it's like, okay, well, the, it, the process is breaking down at the sales page. And that means there's a couple of potential reasons for that. One, my ad might be attracting the wrong type of person or not my ad, but my, my ad or my capture page might be attracting the wrong type of person, right? What is the copy in my ad and my capture page say? Do I need to go back and really review that? And uh, so that could be a possibility or um, my sales my sales uh, presentation or my sales letter is not converting for whatever reason, right? And then at that point, you just kind of have to take your best guess. My best guess is that there's two possibilities. The ad and the capture page that we're promoting is kind of curiosity based. The headline is the five bold, five bold predictions about the future and how they could make you a fortune. And so two things are, one of two things are happening. Either that headline is just getting curiosity seekers, like they're just curious and so I'm getting a really high opt-in rate because people want to see the predictions, but it's not really attracting buyers because I'm not really talking about a solution to a problem of some kind. It really is kind of a curiosity tabloid-like headline, right? Um, where a better headline that might get a lower con a conversion rate, but more buyers might be, um, he, you know, five ways to invest like the wealthy, right? And that would, that would be more specific or, you know, talking to a person that might have a specific desire or a specific problem that they're looking for. Um, so that's one possibility. The next possibility would be the sales presentation. Okay. Well, what's the story with the sales presentation? Well, in my view, what we did is we used a piece of software called uh, well, a Crazy Egg. So you can go to Crazy Egg and you can use something called heat maps. And so you can install this little piece of code on your website that allows you to see the behavior that's taking place on your web page. And so this was a long, it wasn't a sales video, it was a long form sales letter, about 30 to 40 pages long. And when I went into Crazy Egg and I could see the, the visitor sessions using that web page, it showed me that out of all the visitors we got, only a handful, a very small percentage actually read all the way down to the offer. So 99 plus percent of people never even saw the offer. So of course they can't buy. Uh, a couple of people did and, and that was it. But that tells me, hey, this is way too long or it's not interesting enough and it's not pe keeping people's attention all the way down to the offer part. And so the next step for me would be to change, potentially change the headline um, to make it more uh, problem solution oriented rather than curiosity oriented, and then to reduce the length of the sales letter substantially, um, and then just experiment. And that ultimately at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to is experimentation. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for sharing this uh, with us. And could you tell us a little bit more about your Victory Mastermind? I think this is right now your kind of flagship offer. Oh, well, thank you, Matt. All we're really doing right now is, is Victory. And, and Victory is very simple. It basically wraps everything that we are, are you know, into ourselves personally right now and everything that we teach into one product because that comes down to making a very conscious decision about your business model. Uh, Michelle and I wanted a very, very simple business. We didn't want to have multiple offers out there. Just like, hey, well, let's put everything that we do into one, one place, and um, and so that's what the Victory Mastermind is. And the goal there is very specific: is we want to help empower people when it comes to 
their financial lot in life. Uh, it's at this specific point in history right now. There's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot of changes taking place. And I can tell you from personal experience that you're either going to become a victim of those changes or you're going to become a victor. And it really just comes down to how prepared are you, how proactive are you, and how much are you paying attention. Um, and so with Victory, that is something that we're helping people do. We're helping them become self-reliant when it comes to their food, their power, their water, their um, their security. Um, and then we're helping people learn how to invest during uh, economic down, down cycles. Um, and that comes down to what are we doing with crypto? What are we doing with our own personal portfolio? What are we investing in personally? Who are we investing with? Um, and really just documenting that process and sharing that with folks. And, um, and that's pretty much it. And we're, we're having a lot of fun with it and, and we're excited you're a part of that group. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mike. So what's the best place for people to go if you want to check out Mike Dilder's content? <laughs> yeah. Uh, your best place right now would be to victory.com. And depending upon when this comes out, you'll see the funnel that we, we have discussed <laughs> since I haven't had time to, to make any updates yet, but, um, yeah, to victory.com, either T O or the number two, either one works. And that's, uh, that's the best place to go. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mike. And yeah, wishing you all the best. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. All right. So hope that you've enjoyed this episode. And as always, you're going to find all the links we mentioned in the show notes. And if you're a content creator or want to become one and want to monetize your knowledge online, then be also sure to check out my free emails because in my daily emails, you're going to learn how you can speed up your content creation workflow to create more content faster and thus attract more clients online in less time. It's the first link in the description. Thank you very much for tuning in today and I see you next week.